Hi, everyone. Welcome. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to this place. My name is Rachel. It is uh, Saturday morning, January 9th. I actually feel kind of nervous. I haven't live streamed with you guys in like a big podcast week for almost three weeks. And I always feel a little bit out of practice when I first come back after a little bit of a break. I feel refreshed and I feel rejuvenated, but I also am like, ooh, do I know what I'm doing? <laughs> Makes me feel like an amateur. Um, how are you guys? I hope that you're doing really well. I couldn't wait anymore, so we're starting just a couple of minutes early. I just, um, I was excited to talk to you guys and the chat is going crazy and I just, I so appreciate you guys. For those who are not on Slack and didn't see my news, I wanted to share. I got my first uh, vaccine. I got the part one, so I, I am vaccinated. One very small step forward. It felt like a huge, huge deal. Um, there was this real sense of celebration um, in the auditorium where they were uh, doing the vaccinations, and it just it felt really kind of cool to be a part of history. So um, I know that not everybody is pro-vaccine, but in this case, um, it was really exciting, and it was exciting to be a part of it. And uh, the kids were asking me all about it so that they'll be prepared when they're ready to go. And it was just, yeah, it just it felt amazing to be a part of history. So really cool. Before um, the iPad times out again, I had mentioned to the wool circle yesterday that I had started some weaving. I got one of the looms warped up. Oh, and um, so I wanted to share that with you really quickly because it's upstairs in our bedroom and it's on the Leclerc compact. So I'm really sorry for the crappy photo. It's because I had forgotten to take a proper photo and load it into the uh, show. So this is what I'm working on upstairs. They're called the Radiate Towels. These, This is a free pattern from S Sweet Georgia if you're part of the School of Sweet Georgia. I basically used the colors that Felicia had used in hers and um, it's sort of this like bright pink and it, it fades across to a navy blue. I didn't have quite exactly the colors, but I sort of, in my stash of cotton, I sort of pieced them together. I just wanted something that was totally and completely autopilot. And the pattern calls for them to be set at 20, uh, 20 picks per inch and 20 ends per inch. And I've, I'm doing mine at 18. I just wanted to, I, I like the 18 ends per inch with the 2.8 cotton. It just works for the way that I throw the shuttle and the way that I beat. It's just got a nice a nice fabric at the end. So mine are a little bit wider. I think the pattern says 11 and a half inches and mine is 14 and a half inches or 14 inches roughly. Um, these are gonna be towels. I'm hoping to weave off like anywhere between, I think the warp uh, that I put on, I didn't wanna put on a really huge warp. I think it's not super, super long and I think I'll get about five, five towels out of it. And um, I'm going to set them aside for the kids' teachers. So these are going to be towels that are going to be for June. And it's so nice to um, just, you know, have a uh, uh, a project going on the looms again. Um, I don't have the big con the big jack loom, my 45 inch floor loom, uh, my Leclerc jack uh, warped up. My I was hoping to get it to get it warped, but. James is kind of making noises that he wants to do something. So I kind of want to keep it free for another week or two while he decides what he wants to do. If he wants to do something, we're having some issues. Typical boy in his age group with um, just wanting to be like wanting screens all the time and sort of throwing some tamper, temper tantrums about not getting it. So we're uh, encouraging some other things. So he snuck um, my Chromebook this morning. I didn't realize that he had been able to get into it and he was watching stuff on YouTube, which is not okay. So um, we're sort of working with him on that and, and helping him to understand why it's not okay, not just you're not allowed. So all these things that we're navigating so how are you guys? Is that one of the little iPads? I have the same case. Uh, this is an iPad mini. Um, it was actually a gift from our uh, grant from the grandparents, um, my husband's parents, uh, so that they could FaceTime and talk to the kids. And then we got a one of these um, uh, cases for it because Nora keep, kept dropping it. So um, I actually got it over the holidays. Finally, I caved and got a case for it. And it, it, actually, it's been really good because it has a stand at the back. So Anyhow, I, I, I didn't want to show you guys a photo of my weaving on my phone. I know that's really hard for people to see. So I thought, oh, I'll run upstairs with the iPad and I'll take a photo. So, yeah. All right. It is so good to see everybody. Thank you for letting me wax poetic about um, my weaving. It's just really nice to get something onto the loom. I'm not worrying about the weft colors. 
Um, I've just been um, using sort of what I have for bobbins and kind of emptying them off and keeping to the lighter colors. So the overall towels are going to be a little bit more muted. And then now I've emptied all those weaving bobbins that I had from other projects. And now I'm going to start playing around with some of the medium and darker colors. So it'll be really fun to see that difference on the weft. And I'm doing quite large blocks of color. So some of the towels will actually just be one weft color. I'm not worrying about dividing them up as I weave. Sometimes I measure them and I put 4-8 um, cotton in between so that I know exactly where to cut. Uh, this time round, I'm just weaving straight. I'm just going to weave off, have one big piece of fabric. I'll serge each end, wash and finish, and then I'll hem them and cut them up. So, um, how was everybody's um, winter break? How was, how was, how was it? I know some people were able to gather depending on where you are in the world. Some people were on their own. Some people kind of had a hybrid version. Lots of people missed out on traditions and things that they would normally do. So how are you guys doing? Did you get lots done? <laughs> Did you uh, have lots of time to, to do your making or was it pretty quiet? We, my mom is in our household. So it was just the five of us. That was it. We just had a really super quiet few days and it was really quite lovely. I have to admit, I, I, it was the, it was really a lot like the, the Christmases that we had had growing up because there's always just the four of us. We had no family here. And um, I have to admit, it was really, really lovely. I really enjoyed the quiet. We had some really good food. Uh, I did a lot of making, but I felt like I didn't get anything done. So we'll talk about that later in the show. I felt like I kept taking three steps forward and two steps back. And I finally just threw up my hands and was like, okay, universe, I get it. Fine. I won't put any pressure on myself to get anything done. Um, and I will just be content to not really get anything done. And I think that was probably what I needed. So tell me about your, uh, um, tell me about your holidays, you guys. And uh, I know Eve, she was in the UK. So like many, she was affected by the shutdowns. So she was huddled in bed because she said in her comment she had no heating, her boiler broke. So her broiler broke. So she uh, was very cold. We sent her lots of love from, from over here on this side of the pond. Uh, Mars says that she cast on quite a bit. Sarah said her husband and had Christmas, just the two of them, and it was one of the best ones ever. It was so special to just be together. If you can, if, if for those of us, you know, to be able to embrace that and just be like, you know, it's just us and it's not just in a negative way, it can be really great. So uh, thank you, Dana. P pretty design for towels, love a good fade. It works really well because you hold three ends um, at a time. And as you work your way across, you take out a color and add a color as you work your way across with the warp. So I have to say the warp went really fast. Um, it was really, uh, really, really quick. It, and there was only two warp chains, which was really nice. A little bit smaller than what I'm used to. Um, Barbell says, my husband and me were mostly, were mostly just for us. Sometimes we met our two children and my parents. That's lovely. Diane says, just family. It was great. Uh, welcome from Germany. Um, uh, I think, is it Bill? Billy? I'm not exactly sure how to say your name. Um, Kathy B made a hat and started some mitts, but enjoyed not being pressured to get things done. You know, it's funny that you would say that, Kathy, because that was something I really noticed this time around. We had nowhere to be. We didn't have to go out and do anything. There wasn't any, you know, we weren't fighting with traffic to get into Vancouver for some of the things that we like to do. We were kind of just at home. I have to admit, by the end, by New Year's, when the kids were ready to go back to school, I was getting really intense. I was really ready for them to go back, but um, it was it was okay, you know. It was it was good. Merritt says it was a quiet, nice Christmas. Had to work a few days in the middle, but got a lot of knitting done over the New Year. That's wonderful. So let's chat about all the things that are in front and behind me today. So I have a couple of sweaters to talk about. I have a lot of spinning to talk about. And we have a lot that you guys did in the community that I really wanted to get to today. So without further ado, let's get into it. And when we come back, we will start off with just um, some quick announcements about the breeding color study so that that doesn't get lost in translation and you guys know exactly what's going on. So um, yeah, let's do that. And I'm just going to transfer over the credits. So we're having some trouble with the credits. So just let me reload the video. I'm sure it just kind of got stuck. And I'll see you on the other side.
So you know how sometimes your coffee is just not that hot? I feel like that's the case today. So my coffee is just not really super hot and I, I wish that it was a little bit hotter. Let's start off with some announcements about braiding color study. So I'm going to switch to the bigger camera so that you guys can really see what I'm talking about with the colors and you guys can gaze at them while I'm giving you a little bit of information. And then we'll go into talking about some of this other stuff that's on my table right away. Um, so braiding color study uh, will be released and all of the uh, links and everything will go live um, toward the end of next week. Um, so Friday, July, or sorry, January, July, Friday, January 25th. Um, and the listing on Katrina's website will go live on Monday, January 25th. So if you want to make a note, Monday, January 25th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, there will be a link that will go live for patrons of the community at 9 a.m. We are doing Shetland this time around, and there will be more information coming to you uh, next uh, on, on the 15th, there will be more information. So just mark those notes down. Wool and Spinning Radio will go live on Friday, J January 15th with all of the information and then the listing and everything will go live on Monday, January 25th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we are looking at Shetland this time around and we're doing three braids. These will be av available as full braid sets and half braid sets. We're doing a creamy brown oatmeal. These are, this ties in beautifully with our natural shades along. So we're doing a creamy brownie gray. It's a very warm gray. Uh, we're doing white Shetland, which is here. And you can see how the colors just are nice and bright on the white Shetland. And then we're doing a Moret. And the Moret uh, is just beautiful. It's quite dark. And of course you can see between these two braids, uh, if you line up where the natural shade is and you match up sort of where the colorway falls, you can see how like the creamy yellow in the more in that's really, really apparent in the white gets lost in the more. It's not quite as pronounced. And in this spinning, it'll be really interesting to see how this transition between the, the natural more to the, um, burnt orange, how that kind of works out. So, uh, really excited about this, uh, upcoming breeding color study. You do not, you do not, I repeat, you do not need to, uh, um, purchase fiber from Katrina to participate. Our breeding color studies, this is an opportunity to come together as a community to work together. There's nothing formal that I, um, that I do like to sort of facilitate your study. Your study is up to you. You can purchase fiber from anywhere. You can stash dive. You can um, put together a few different things from a few different sources. It's totally up to you. You can go with a half braid set and put in other stuff from your stash. Um, it's up to you. We just offer the fiber and the colors so that you sort of have a jumping off point about like where to go and how to structure your study. But there's no like actual, this is a combed top this time. So carded is the latter half of the year and combed is the first half of the year. Um, so we just offer you sort of the, the the jumping ground. So this time around, we're sort of looking at these oranges, which we really haven't done before. And we're looking at black and blue, which we really, we've done black in the past, but we haven't done it in relation to, a na to natural shades. So we're sort of looking at natural shades, natural colors. We're looking at primitive breeds in terms of the Shetland natural shades. We're doing quite a few different things. This is going to be a, a challenging study in terms of what to do with these and how to use them. You can add in other fibers and other colors. You can combo spin them together. You can, it's up to you. There isn't like a formal thing that we do when we're doing breeding color. So, um, that is breeding color and uh, that will go live on January 25th at 8, 9 a.m. for patrons and 10 a.m. for public for everybody. And there will be pre-orders. So if you don't want to be a part of sort of that initial frenzy, if you wait a little bit, I will be posting and Katrina will post in her newsletter as well. Uh, and it'll be on Instagram and whatnot, um, the information for pre-orders after, especially if you want larger quantities. So we are sort of saying to everybody, please be aware of quantities and how much you're ordering. I know people like to have larger quantities of stuff. If you want larger quantities, maybe you would be willing to wait and do a pre-order so that you can um, get as much as you want. So just think about that, please. Um, oh, that's a good idea, Sarah. She's thinking about making the Velocour. That's a great idea with that fiber. So that's a pattern by Andrea Maori. That would be really cool. 
Um, very rarely before Rain Color do I know what I'm going to do right off the bat, but I already totally have a plan that I'm going to do with my braids. That's awesome, Kelly. Colors are lovely. Thank you. Mm. You might be surprised, Sarah. She says a super cropped version. You might be surprised how much yardage you can get out of that, especially if you put a natural color that's solid with it. You might actually be able to make a full, a full length one. Yeah. So over the holiday, I made quite a few skeins of yarn and it was really kind of fun, except that every thing that I made kind of went two steps forward and three steps back, like I said earlier. So um, let's start off with this here. This is um, uh, West Coast Coloring Carding. Uh, this is Falkland, both of these braids. And I had bought these uh, when Rebecca was down in March for uh, uh, Fibers West, which ended up being canceled. And uh, my plan was to spin these together. So to spin, um, spin them separately, but together for a project. And I wanted to have a two ply. I wanted them to be quite round and, or like quite firmly plied. Falkland can take a lot of twist. It's sort of a, a finer wool. It's, um, it's a really, I, it's one of my absolute most favorites. That along with Finn um, and Romney, um, those are probably, and Shetland, those are probably like some of my favorite wools if I ever was sort of put on the spot. Um, the thing that happened with this was, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit of a story. So just bear with me and you can gaze at all the pretty for a minute. Uh, and I would love to hear if you guys have had this situation in the past as well. We went camping for, um, back in September. So we were same as many other places. I don't want to make it sound like we were in a unique situation here in British Columbia because we certainly were not. It, this was just sort of our situation at this time. Uh, we d wanted to go camping a few more times into the fall because we really didn't get away very much over the course of the summer. Everything was booked. It's very difficult to get camping here right now because you know, people are wanting to get out, they're wanting to get away, but you know, you're, really your only option is to go camping. So, you know, even in our own cul-de-sac, people were going camping this summer who have always said they would never camp. So we um, went the second weekend in September. So not the Labor Day weekend, the first weekend in September, but the next one. And we figured we could get in no problem wherever we went. Well, we drove up to Merritt, which is about um, two hours from here, towing. You can go faster if you're just in a vehicle. Uh, but towing, it's about two hours for us. And the kids did amazing. It was after school on Friday. We left right away. Anyways, we got there and it was absolutely full. Overflow was full. It was full. Lots of baby boomers who probably had come during the week and were sort of staying through the weekend, which I actually thought was great. Like, why be in the city and here when you don't need to be home for school and whatnot, right? So we kept driving and we went up to a place called Tunkwa, which is outside of Kamloops, British Columbia. And uh, it's about three hours from here. Um, it's near Logan Lake for those who know that part of British Columbia. It's a wonderful campground, Shh, don't tell anyone. But there's no water uh, and there's no like amenities. It's really off the grid, but it's quite a big campground. It's really known for its fishing. And there's ATV trails. So there's a third campground that's separate where all the ATV people go. And it's kind of just pull in and camp wherever and park wherever. So there's always spots available because people don't like to go where they don't have water, right? Which I totally get when you've got a big RV and we've got just a small trailer and we carry water anyways. So, um, I was spinning, I brought my e-spinner and I had brought a couple of projects and I, I finished my Cumbria while we were gone and while we were there. And I had thrown in my Falkland at the last minute just to, um, if I got time, I would start it. But so I started it and I started spinning it quite a bit thicker than what I had originally planned for because my original plan was for a shifty which is a pullover by Andrew Mowry. It's mosaic. If you don't know it, um, definitely go and look it up. It's a, it's a very popular pattern. I've made the shifty cowl. Lots of people in our community have done the sweater and they've done the night shift, which is a big, um, shawl. And they've also done the cowl. So now I'm sort of torn whether or not I should match this and spin them the same, um, and make this slightly bigger gauge like I did with this. Um, cause this has come out more of like a DK. It's not super even in the spinning for, for me. It's, it's, a bit inconsistent and it's a little bit overspun in places. Um, I do really like the color. I really love that there's sort of these really gentle, quiet places where there's this gorgeous purple that comes through, which is really nice. 
but unfortunately overall like if you if you take a moment to look at my yarn and look at the yarn not the colors you can really see it's a two ply and it just is not very even like I've got these areas that are quite thin like I have no idea what happened there and it's over twisted and then I've got areas that are very plump and and really round and have a really nice aesthetic I'm not really sure what happened and I think probably sometimes what happens when I when I put stuff on my e-spinner and I found this when I was testing the plyology wheel as well it was the same thing I almost kind of um put this speed I my hands move really quickly when I'm spinning and it's almost kind of like when you're spinning and uh, on a wheel, your your feet do compensate for what you're doing and for what your hands are doing. So you'll start to you know treadle a bit faster if your hands are moving faster. And then if your hands slow down, you'll sort of treadle and you'll slow down your treadling. And the more you do that, the more intrinsic it becomes and you don't even notice that you're doing it. But with the e-spinner, I've really noticed that if I put the speed up, I it continues to spin and continues to turn um, and starts to really put a lot of twist into my fiber but my hands kind of slow down and they actually go slower on the e-spinner than they do on the treadle wheel and I think part of that is because my feet aren't moving and so I almost kind of like zone out and I kind of almost get into this like it's kind of like I call it the sleepy draft <laughs> where I'm almost kind of like you know, like I almost kind of like slow down and I get super, super distracted and I'm not really super engaged. And then I end up with these yarns that I feel like, well, to be totally and completely honest, I feel really disappointed by. Um, there, were, It's overspun in places, it's underspun in other places, and it's not particularly consistent. So I'm not sure what to do about it. I'm kind of, I've am kind of been meditating on it over the course of the fall because I had this spin that I did over the holiday. I am so happy with this. This is Kent Romney from Hello Yarn. It was one of her fall colorways. Um, I had signed up for Fiber Club just for a few months to um, just get some color because of, you know, we're all home right now and um, it was just nice to kind of have a little package come, you know, a few months in a row that, that had some color in it. And um, this one just really spoke to me. I can't remember what it's called. Maggie, do you have it nearby? Because I know that you're part of that Fiber Club as well. Was it Bitter Roots? Was it called? It was the Kent Romney. Uh, I think it was Bitter Roots. And it really, uh, and I did this on the plyology wheel. So with this one, and so the plyology wheel, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can go back to previous episodes and have a look. Um, the plyology wheel, I was I was testing out for them and sort of doing being a beta tester for them, and I shared it on the wool circle quite a bit. And um, I... Uh, um, so I threw this on there because I really wanted to get it spun and I thought, you know, I really want to do a project that I'm really excited about and that will get me onto the wheel and get me spinning because I have to admit when it comes to spinners, I'm not the quickest to jump on. Um, I tend to sort of look at them and look at the project, but I don't sit down and work at it. So um, I've really noticed that about myself. It doesn't take a lot to give me the motivation to get onto a treadle wheel. It doesn't get it doesn't take a lot to get me to pick up my spindles either but onto a spinner. And I think it's partially a mental block because I keep them for uh, camping. And I was able to pass the plyology wheel. I did the review and everything for Jason and uh, Kim for them. And I sent that off to them. And I've actually passed it on to Chrissy of Snappy Stitches. So uh, we did a socially distanced exchange in the Starbucks parking lot. She's doing really super well. And she hasn't been spinning at all because since the birth of their third. So um, she's hoping to get, um, to get, on and, and test it out and, and play with it a little bit. So she's excited to do that. Um, so what I did with this was I took the braid and I stripped it lengthwise in half. And then I took that one half and I put it aside. And then I took the other half and I split it down the middle um, once as well. So I had two long strips of fiber and I actually pre-drafted it all the way down. Um, and I, I just kept pre-drafting and pre-drafting and I really lengthened it out and really put a lot of air into it. And then I did the same with the other half of the braid. So it was basically um, the colorway repeated twice. And that gave me these long areas and these long strips where the colors matched up. And 
I ended up with 480 yards post washing of yarn. So the nice thing about that is that's more than enough to make the spark cardigan, which is a shawl collar uh, with a background, a solid, a sort of a, a solid background color. And then she uses, um, I think it's spin cycle dyed in the wool, but I might be wrong for the color, for the color work. And it's an all over color work cardigan with a, with a belt, um, and a shawl collar. It's totally my style. And so I think that this is going to be the color work section of that. And then the solid will be some Romney, which is on my e-spinner. I wanted to spin it on the e-spinner so that I would have a matching um, a matching yarn in terms of how it was spun. And so the natural, I have so much of this. I talked about it extensively yesterday on the wool circle. This will be a three ply to give me the structure that I want to need for the shawl and whatnot. Half of this fiber will be for a gentle morning for my mom and half of this fiber will be for the spark cardigan for me. I have so much of this fiber and this is Romney as well. It's local, it's from Disdero Ranch and I'm gonna spin them the same. Um, and I need a sport weight for the spark cardigan or uh, I need 14 wraps per inch. Is that uh, sport or was it a DK at 12 wraps per inch? I can't remember. Anyways, I'll spin for my mom's sweater, see how much I have left over and then we'll go from there. So I'll match them. The interesting thing coming back to the e-spinners and the differences between these yarns. Um, I think the reason why I'm really super happy with this and why this ended up being really super consistent and it really came out exactly how I wanted it. Um, the twist, as you can see, is very, very even. Uh, the, the yarn consistency is very much what I was going for. It's very, very, like to me, this is a very aesthetically pleasing yarn. I didn't put a ton of twist in it. It doesn't need a ton of twist because it's Romney. Um, it's very long stapled. Um, and of course you want that sheen. And I think the final twist angle was about... Let's just have a look here. Yeah, the final twist angle is about 35 degrees. Show that to you guys here if I can find the camera. Huh. There we go. So it's about 35 degrees. I'm, I'm trying not to pull on it too, too much. Um, and that's just a really lovely twist angle for the Romney. Like it'll wear, it'll wear like, it'll go through the wars. Um, it doesn't need that really tight twist angle. And I think what, what, what I did that was different was first of all, I really prepped the fiber. I spent the time and I went through and I pre-drafted it, you know, and I, I really like set it up for, um, for success basically. You know, I really like, you know, I pre-drafted it, I prepped it, I loaded it on my disc staves. Um, I, I really, and then when I was at the wheel, I was really focused on the fiber and on the spinning itself and really paying attention to the process. And with this, I just zoned right out. And you know, the spinners, just because you're not treadling, uh, you really need to find a way or I need to really find a way to still engage and to still be a part of the process and a part of the spinning, which is what I've been doing with the Romney sampling that I've been doing. And we'll talk more about the Romney sampling next week because I've been playing around with what I want to do with it. This is my sample card. And I did talk about it a lot yesterday on the uh, wool circle. So for those who are subscribers um, of that or higher, um, please have a look at, at what we talked about yesterday. I was super, I was feeling really out of practice yesterday and we had some camera problems and you guys were so gracious. So thank you so, so, so much. Christy, thank you so much. The colorway was Sweet Treats. I guess Bitter Roots was a different one from the fall because the colors this fall for the Hello Yarn Club, they were all, like they were quite similar. If you are, were thinking about maybe doing a shifty uh, sweater to come back to that pattern again, that actually might be a really good one uh, to choose if you have a whole bunch of the Hello Yarn Club fiber from this fall because the colors were different enough. Like this one had that crazy yellow in it. Um, I'll show it under this camera. It has that crazy yellow in it that I love so much. Uh, but it, it really, they all really coordinate well. Like a couple of them have purples and blues, but they were that same wine purple. So if you were thinking about planning a sweater like that and you have those colorways, um, that's a really, I was going to say this, um, over the, uh, fall when I was looking at some of this stuff, a really great way if you want to do some of this stuff where you've got these coordinating skeins of fiber and color 
if you're wanting to do something like say the shifty, it's just a great example of a, you know, it's a pullover um, and it's a round neck and then you work your way down and you need uh, three contrast colors and then a main background color. If you're really having trouble putting colors together and you're really having a difficult time sort of envisioning how the mosaic knitting is going to work up and how it's going to work its way down, if you take three or four braids that are all coordinating from the same dyer um, and do some sampling and see what your grist is going to be. So how what what your so that you have a rough idea of what your yardage will be, so you know how many braids you need. It's a really great way to sort of um, start the project planning, and then you know do a night shift cowl or do a night or sorry the night shift um, uh, shawl or do the do the cowl or look at some other patterns that are based on some of the same ideas of this mosaic knitting where you're moving the colors down. Uh, they were talking about a gorgeous shawl pattern in Virtual Spin Group the other day. Same idea where you've got this mosaic of color moving down and you've got a solid background. It just kind of helps you to start to get the idea of how colors move when you're dealing with some of these skeins. And then practice, if you if you like these long, you know, these slower transitions of color, try some different ways of spinning these yarns and playing with them. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a moment because we'll be talking about my jingle sweater. I just want to catch up on chat because I, I'm i waxing poetic about all the things spinning. Um, nice to hear an experienced spinner say that they've spun a yarn that isn't perfect. Thanks, Eve. A good reminder that even the experts get it wrong too. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I almost didn't ply this. And then the plying was a pain because it was over twisted in places. So the singles got really super twisted and tangled and virtual spin group. I sat there on Tuesday morning and fixed them and I got it. I got the rest of it plied, but it was such a heartbreaker. Um, and it's just a really good reminder. I find that a bit tricky with e-spinning. You just can't adjust the speed. Absolutely. Um, I like the metronome idea. That's a great idea. The thing is I find with the metronome, I think this is from my years of piano. I start to tune it out. <laughs> I like start to ignore it. Um, however, it's a great idea if your fiber is really super well prepped and you can sit there and just spin. Uh, my concern would be what when you come back to the wheel, I wonder if you would start to default into that. But then maybe that would help with your consistency at the wheel too. So that's a good, a neat idea to think about. Uh, spinning a sweater quantity of Rambo from Adrian Love for Color Sense. I do too. Yeah, hello. Um, Dana mentioned about Hello Yarn um, and her colors. They're just beautiful. Sarah's doing the spark cardigan. Of course you are, Sarah. We do all of the same sweaters. <laughs> I think you and I have a very similar color aesthetic. Um, does Romney hold its shape well? It does. It has really nice drape. Um, it's a really nice woolly wool. It's a long wool. Um, some people would say, depending on the quality and where it comes from and the staple length, that it could be kind of a medium wool. Um, I'm really sort of starting to get away from the uh, idea of using sort of medium wool as a way to explain about where a wool fits because so many of the wools, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. I would love to hear your thoughts. So many of the wools that we use in our day-to-day uh, -day, um, sort of projects, they're so soft, like they are so fine. Um, like this Romney is more than next to the skin soft and I would absolutely put a baby in this. That is how soft it is. So to describe it as a long wool at least gives you an idea of sort of what it is in terms of like the, it's a longer staple length. It's gonna have a really nice drape. It doesn't have a lot of bulk. So when you squeeze it in your hands, like this is Cormo, this has a lot of bulk. Um, when you squeeze it in your hand and you squash it down, it bounces right back up again. So you know that this yarn out of this Carmo is going to have, it's going to sproing, it's going to bounce, it's going to be poofy, right? So if you spin a fingering, it's going to come out of the wash like a sport. Romney, on the other hand, doesn't have as much bulk. When you squoosh it down, it doesn't have that bounce back tendency. Like look at this Rambo here, which we're going to talk about next. You know, you can really squoosh it and really like cinch it down. The Romney, not so much. It's a bit harder. It's a little bit denser. Um, it has a wee bit of a halo, but it has luster um, and it's longer stapled and your drafting zone, your length of draft, your distance of draft is going to be a little bit longer. So my hand was quite far back when I was spinning this. And I don't actually know if I have any video of me actually spinning it. Um, I know I have video of the plyology wheel, but I'm not sure I have video of actually spinning this. So I will have a look and we'll include that um, at some point. So 
that is the Romney. Let me just uh, make sure I haven't missed anything else. I have the spark on my needles right now. I'm loving this knit. That's wonderful, Nicole. I can't wait to see photos. Please um, post them. Instead of a metronome, what about a song? Okay, funny story, Kathy. One of my favorite playlists on Spotify is called Chill Tracks. If you guys are looking for some just really nice background music, especially when you've got people over, Chill Tracks is an awesome playlist. Not chill hits, chill tracks. Uh, it's a great one. And the... Um, but it's, it doesn't like, it's not, it's not fast. It's slow. And so often when I'm listening to that, my spinning gets slower and slower, and slower. <laughs> um, yeah, I can tell when I'm, when I'm listening to some of that stuff. I really like classical. I love opera, um, tenor, some of the tenor, uh, sing, um, uh, musicians out there like, Je uh, Josh, Josh Groban, uh, the Canadian tenors when they're, when they're actually recording, um, Mark, oh, what's his last name? Anyways, I love a lot of that music. Andrea Bocelli just does it for me every time. I Mike took me, I don't know if you guys know this, when for my 35th, was it 35th? My 35th birthday must have been because we had both kids. Or maybe I was 33. Anyways, he took me to an Andrea Bocelli concert. Oh, it was in Rogers Arena, which is kind of too bad because it's such a big venue. But Heather Headley, she was performing and she did Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I cried. I fully cried. Um, if you guys don't know Heather Headley, she's a, an artist. Um, her voice. Oh, my goodness gracious. Look her up and look up on YouTube. Um, okay, I have to share this with you and then we'll move on. Uh, Heather Headley, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It even comes up as the first thing. Oh my goodness gracious, you guys. Like, okay, after the live stream, check that out. Save that link. <laughs> um, anyways, we probably need to uh, move on. So the, um, yeah, combination of solids and variegated is becoming my favorite project combo. So Mars, it's funny you would say that because that's actually my favorite. And for the shift sweater, I am going to do some swatching this week. I'm hoping to do it this um uh, this week, I have my other, my Polworth in silk that I had spun for the background and it's a semi-solid as well. So the whole thing will sort of be semi-solid and we'll sort of move through. And then I have the third colorway for the contrast colors upstairs. And I'm just going to do some swatching and see if this is salvageable or not. So, um, okay. So funny story, Eve, she says, I listen to ACDC, Aerosmith and Ramenstein. So, or Ramstein. So I grew up on like Black Sabbath, um, ACDC, Nine Inch Nails, um, some of the, uh, death metal from the, um, from Scandinavian countries because my brother was a lead guitarist in a heavy metal band and a death metal band. So death metal is like really super fast. And, um, he actually turned down, um, a record deal, like going on tour with a band and doing the whole thing to go to be an economist. <laughs> He's so responsible. Anyways, that's what I grew up with in the morning, every morning. It was horrible. Um, Ramboulet. So this is the Long Way Homestead uh, Breed uh, Fiber Club. I worked on this over the holiday. It was the spin that would not end. Um, I actually was feeling a wee bit frustrated with it towards the end. I felt a little bit like, okay, this needs to end. Um, I s ended up spinning it long draw. I really kind of struggled to get this one going. This is a two ply. Uh, we talked about this yesterday on the wool circle and I showed myself spinning it and, and doing the long draw. Um, it was not difficult to, to, to draft out the fibers and to get them spinning long draw. Um, long way homestead does it's 12 installments. It's a breed study and, um, it, it, it's just a really lovely opportunity to work through a whole bunch of breeds and um, get an idea of sort of what's out there and what's available. So this Rambo ended up being 700 yards of two ply. It's a fingering weight. It's roughly 18, 18 to 22 wraps per inch. And it, I really got stalled on my cornwall spin, which is why it's right here. Um, that I had had processed from my friend, Sarah Elizabeth, um, Sarah Elizabeth Fiberworks up in Nelson, British Columbia. And I had done the first bobbin and I was spinning it mostly uh, continuous uh, backward and just really feeling the struggle. And the Cormo, um, uh, I got the fleece from Sarah Elizabeth, but then Liz of Kingdom, she processed it for me. And she's done a beautiful job on the pin drafter, just absolutely gorgeous. Let me just pull off a bunch of it here for you and I'll, I'll share it with you. So this is it here. 
look at how white that is hey like it like the camera's blowing out it's so white like that is just unbelievable and it's this gorgeous pin drafted roving and you can see um, her pin drafter is fine enough that it can handle the cormo. So this is from Liz of, of Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks in, in Vermont. And um, you can see just the fineness of the fibers. Like it is so fine. So after spinning the Rambo and really having some like just such good results with the long draw, that's what I'm going to do with the Cormo. I'm going to go back onto the wheel, hopefully this week or next week, and um, try spinning it long draw. Uh, it's pin drafted roving. It's got that nice stickiness to it. So the Rambo really, like it's sticky. I like that that the fine wools do really well uh, when they're spun long draw when it's a, a carded prep because they're they're fine right in that crimp and those those wool scales they stick to each other so as you're drawing out if you've got lots of twist run, and they take a lot of twist because of that fine crimp so you've kind of like got this perfect situation where you can practice your long draw on this fine wool put lots of twist in it and, um, you know, so that you, you're sort of not worried about breaking your singles. And um, you've got this lovely twist running up and you can kind of draw back and fall into a nice rhythm. And that's exactly what happened with this. It still came out cr a crazy amount of yardage for four ounces of fiber. Uh, but that's what I'm going to try with the Cormo and see where I end up. Because the initial uh, plyback samples and sampling and stuff that I did, I really wasn't happy with it. And I actually have... Uh, some photos to share with you of it. So let me transition to that and um, I'll show you the photos of the Cormo so that you can see what it looks like. So this is the Cormo samples that I had done. So this was a three ply and I had spun it continuous back and um, I just didn't think that it worked really super well. It just wasn't... Um, it was kind of bulky, it was kind of fuzzy, it didn't have really nice definition in the singles. Whereas with the Rambo, if I hold this right up to the camera, it's a two ply and same thing, Just let me get it right in the right spot. This two ply being so fine, it'll go into the dye pots and it will just take the dye in a beautiful way. Um, and it'll be bright and bouncy and sprongy and this would make a, just an awesome background yarn for something. I don't know what, but something. So that's that's my plan. So welcome Megan. I'm glad that uh, you're here. How's your arm? She got vaccine number two. That's wonderful. Um, congratulations. I had trouble with Cormo 2, didn't want to be a DK weight, wanted to be lace only, totally. That's what I found with the Rambo. So the Rambo really wanted to be spun fine as well. What weight did the Cormo come out? So this, so the Cormo I'm still working on, but the Rambo came out, um, of fingering weight. It was a, uh, I think yesterday on the wool stream, the wool circle, I said that it came out about 20 wraps per inch and I went back and looked at it again and it's about 20 wraps per inch. So that's the Rambo and it's about, this is the long way homestead, uh, Rambo and it's, um, it's about 700 yards in total. I did have some waste, uh, or sorry, some loss in the finishing, but overall it was just like, it's a ton of yardage. So what do you do with it? What do you do? That's the problem. The Cormo in the photos, that one is, um, I was going for a DK weight. Um, so that was a DK and actually I don't know if I have the sample right here. I should because I keep everything together because otherwise I lose everything, which you guys know. So it's quite firm. Been sitting in skein form for quite a number of weeks now. It feels dense to me now coming up with like coming, um, um, like coming back to it now, it feels dense and it, it feels kind of heavy and uh, it is a, let's see what it is. I think it's about 11 wraps per inch, maybe even nine. Yep, 10 wraps per inch. Yeah, so 10 wraps per inch is what, worsted weight? What would you guys call 10 wraps per inch? It's kind of right in between worsted and DK. So I always think of DK as being like 11 to 12 wraps per inch, sport weight about 14 wraps per inch. How about you guys? How do you kind of get over that and figure that out? Because I find in spinning, it's not really, um, 
like sometimes it like sometimes our yarns might look like um you know 10 wraps per inch for example but then you go to knit with them and they knit higher or lower so uh eve says aaron worsted yeah so it for me it's too thick dk is 12 yeah okay so you guys are kind of on the same page thanks eve I have a llama fleece that I want to be processed, says, says Sharon. Is Will Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks be a good place? You'll have to talk to Liz. And I'm, Liz isn't here today because they're out in the woods. Um, I chatted with her yesterday, actually. Um, so you'll have to contact her. I know that she can do alpaca. So I'm pretty sure that she can do llama. There aren't a lot of llama where she is in uh, northern Vermont. Um, so she would like to do more alpaca. Um, I'm not sure about llama, but I know that she would like to do more um alpaca but she doesn't have access to it as fiber so uh that's something that she would that that we've talked about in the past her and i actually yeah it depends on how you knit it thanks diane uh, i i agree so let's talk about some knitting do you guys want to talk about jingle first or do you want to talk about marmor <laughs> marmor i always feel like rrr, rrr. <laughs> Today's show, I think, is going to be a little bit longer. So, uh, oh, Debbie, you're in the chat. Debbie Pierce, I need your mailing address for your ship for your uh, stitch markers. Um, I almost said shift markers um, for your your stitch markers that you won last time round. So, I want to send those out to Debbie. So, if you could send me an email with your mailing address, I would really appreciate that. I sent you a message on Patreon. Oh, Sharon, you spoke first. So, let's talk about jingle. Last time, my jingle sweater. Um, only had the body done, but we didn't, I didn't have the sleeves done. And I talked about wanting to make the sleeves a little bit longer. Uh, and I talked about, uh, how much yarn of the tough and tender I had used. So I, the solid color of this is, um, Crafty Jack's tough and tender. It's a Targi, Superwash Targi nylon base. I think it's 90, 10 or 80, 20. And what I put with it was my uh, organic Polworth spin that I had done that you just saw a whole bunch of photos of. So this yarn uh, was from Kimfolk and Kylan's been um, um, battling cancer for the last little while. So I don't know if she and hearts, prayers, all the things to her for healing and um, speedy recovery. Because uh, And her color sense, oh my goodness, I just, Ky she is... And she's just a gem of a person. Um, I just love her. She, um, because I was so happy with how um, th this turned out, I coveted this braid of fiber <laughs> for years. I bought it in 2014. I have no idea what the colorway is because I've long since lost the label. And um, I was going to reach out to Kylan and ask her, but I also kind of didn't want to bother her. Uh, cause I know she's got a lot on her plate right now. So this is the original braid here. And, um, I, I did the same thing with this that I did with my Kent Romney. So I really like this way of prepping braids. I don't spin a lot of color anymore. Like I used to, I do a lot with the natural shades. I do a lot with white because I really want to get into dyeing more. And guess what Mike is buying me today at Canadian Tire? He's getting me a cooktop because we built a new desk over Christmas. And so I have a brand new work surface, which you guys may have noticed with the product camera. Um, the surface below is, is different. And, uh, and I can reach now, like it's right here. Um, I can make it a sit to stand desk. I can adjust the height, everything. So the original, so the table that was in here is an old Ikea table. It is in the garage and it is a dyed surface for me. So um, I haven't done any dyeing for the last number of years because I don't want to do it in the kitchen. And um, I really wanted a place to be able to do it. Um, absolutely, Eve, he is such a keeper. I have a very good, a very good husband. <laughs> um, I am so lucky because he, he gets it um, in terms of like that need, that need and that want to create and to share and build a creative life and to build a homemade, a handmade home. And like, he's just, he just gets it. Um, so because I don't work with comb top very much and I kind of end up like stashing these a lot of the time and so I have sort of a cabinet full of, of braids and um but I, I've kind of figured out over the years the way that I and actually writing unbraided with Katrina really helped me to figure out what I like and what um the yarns are that I really want to work with and so I really like these ones that where I lay them out just like this and I strip them down the middle just once and after I strip them down I take each of those halves and I 
pre-draft them and pre-attenuate them as much as I possibly can. Uh, and that for me, it, it creates those long, slow transitions of color, like so that you don't have like red, green. Because when you draft it out, when you've got multiple dyes on one staple length, like if your staple is like this long and I've got this gorgeous sunlight streaming in and I, I know it creates glare, but we haven't had any sun. I'm just going to bask in it. <laughs> um, so the, the if the staple is this long and you've got red over here and you've got green over here, when you draft that apart and prep it for spinning, that staple has two different colors on it. And so you're going to end up with a little bit of green over here and a little bit of red over here. And that creates that transition. And that creates that barber pulling in there that some of us really like and some of us really don't like. But what I really like in the grand scheme of things, if you can kind of keep the bigger picture in mind, is that you end up with these yarns where you have the colors plying together and if you have sections where it just isn't matching up at all and you're getting miles and miles of yarn where there's no matching up you can break your singles and get rid of that little bit and get to the next part but as your spinning becomes more and more consistent and more and more even you'll find that your yarns become more and more matched up in a really nice way so even though i had miles of yardage of this and i have all of this left over I thought this was the perfect sweater to use for it because it created, because I knew that in the, in the baubles, in the yoke, I would get that lovely transition of that red and green. And it just felt really Christmassy for me. So uh, I don't have any sort of holiday type things. And I'm working on Mina Phillips cowl. Uh, the pattern's called the evil eye. Uh, and I'm just, I, I just started the section where you're fading into the color work and I'll, I'll, I've kind of saved it for next show because I, I sort of got a little bit, um, um, bogged down with everything that I had on the needles. My hand was starting to really bother me over the holiday. It, like I said, two steps forward, three steps back. My, my, um, the back of my hand was, and I wasn't doing any purling. So that was a first. Uh, and I think it was just, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to, to work on things and to do things. And I just had to take a step back. So this particular sweater pattern by Isabel Kramer is a really, really great one. Um, it's a top down. If you've never done color work before, this is a great pattern to, uh, think about. There are some great, easy, simple, top-down, yoke, yoked sweaters for those who kind of want to delve into that um, realm and they only want to use two colors. This pattern actually calls for two contrast colors. So you have your main background color and then you're supposed to have these hits. They're meant to be like little sparkles on the baubles. Um, that is a second contrast color. And um, I skipped that. So those marks on the chart where I was supposed to have a second contrast color, because I had this in mind, this yarn, um, I just didn't work those those other colors. So the whole yoke is just the one color and I completely ignored on the chart the second color. I made those stitches this. Does that make sense? So if there was a stitch of the background color, a stitch of the contrast color number one, and then a stitch of contrast color number two, for me it became background color, contrast color number one, contrast color number two, and carry on. So I ignored the contrast color number two. I just used contrast color number one for everything. So I hope that's clear as mud. Fits beautifully. I think Isabel, um, I don't know why, but her sweaters just fit me. They, they, I didn't make any modifications. The only change that I would make if I could do this again is the short rows. You work short rows underneath the yoke to lift up the back of the sweater. So you do short rows at the back neck, but then you start into the color work really quickly. So you don't fully push up the back neck. You do that, you do more underneath the yoke and you work short rows right at the top of the bust right here. And that's the only thing I wish I had done was different, a different type of short row. Um, the ones that I chose, I can't remember if I used Carol Sunday's short rows or I can't remember, or maybe some that Vera Val Mackey uses, but they weren't completely invisible, which I was really surprised about after I got further down the body. So that would be the only thing that I would change. So... Oh, Samantha, that's wonderful. Hubby is donating his shed to me for somewhere to die, card prep, etc. It's funny because the prep, having the table out there, that means I'll have somewhere to put the drum carter now too and I won't have to use it on the counter in the kitchen because we have a peninsula in our kitchen so it's like the perfect place to put the drum carter. But the thing is like 
all that dirt and dust gets onto the counter and then I have to really make sure it's washed and cleaned and the floor too. I'm really looking forward to be able to do that in the garage from now on. So thank you, uh, Kirsten. Lovely sweater. She says, definitely need your own space for dyeing, says Deborah. Yeah, agreed. Um, interested in dyeing with plants. I want to try that this summer. That's wonderful, Barbel. My spinning is even. It's my braid splitting that is not precise. It's funny, Diane, because I always get... Um, uh, I always think that I should like weigh them, you know, like as I'm splitting them, I should weigh them and, um, and be really super precise. And then I'm like, no, <laughs> there are some things that I'm just not willing to do. And that is one of them. And so I just try to eyeball it as best I can. If I think that one is quite a bit heavier, I will try to even, even them out a little bit, but I'm just not willing to get really super micromanagey about it. So I don't know if that, if that uh, helps or not, maybe it's not helpful. Um, Eve was wondering about spinning a braid to avoid striping. I think one of the biggest things that I learned from writing Unbraided with Katrina was um, that no matter how you spin these braids of fiber, there is always going to be a little bit of striping because you have color put on in increments to begin with. And if you don't want striping, you really have to work with solid colors or semi-solids. Um, and there's just, that was the biggest thing that I learned in writing that book. Even if you do fractals, the the only other option is to take all of those colors in the braid and card it all together and, and make a gray or a brown by combi combining them all together and then spinning them. Um, it, there's always going to be a little bit of striping, um, even if you do your best to minimize it. So what I've kind of learned is how do we work with these yarns? And they're not the main thing that I um, that I spin anymore, which you guys know. I work a lot from, from larger quantities of, of pin drafted fiber because I don't have tons and tons of time to uh, do the fiber prep and I haven't really had a space either. So I'm just catching up with chat. I, let's talk about Marmore. So Marmore is a pattern by, I don't know how to say her last name, but uh, Regina, Regina, Regina Mossmore. She has a ton of patterns on Ravelry and a ton of, of patterns sort of just out there. So um, uh, let's talk about this. So I was actually down to 13 inches on the body. This is another two steps forward, three steps back. This is kind of more like 10 steps back. Um, I started this after ripping out the Fireside Pullover by Jane Richmond. I had knit it years ago. This is from Semiamu um, uh, Suffix. Um, and I just realized I think I spent Semiahu uh, wrong. Um, it, that's an area in... Um, uh, South Surrey here in, in the lower, uh, lower Fraser Valley. I had ripped out Fireside because it didn't fit me, uh, anymore. And, um, I never really wore it to begin with. So I sort of just, um, you know, I thought, you know what, I really want to reclaim the yarn. I loved knitting the pattern, but maybe it's time to move on. And I just realized I'm in the middle of a row, which is really too bad, but I was down to, uh, 13 inches on the body and I put it on and I, I, the photos will scroll through eventually, but basically what ended up happening was the front of the sweater crossed across my body, like so that the entire front came across um, underneath and on top. And so I had about 18 inches of extra fabric and I had no more yarn. And I've already knit a sweater out of this yarn. So like I know that I have enough yarn to do a sweater. And um, that sweater, the Fireside Pullover, has a big shawl collar. It's overlapped. It's a pullover. Like, it, you know, it's long sleeved. I made the sleeves way longer so I could roll them back for camping. Like, it, I, know, I know I have enough yarn. So I asked Virtual Spin Group what they would do. Or maybe I asked Queries and Explorations. I was really torn. And um, so what I've ended up doing is I did rip it out. Uh, I ripped it back to the underarms because there's increases to make an A-frame shape as you work your way down. So there's increases in the shawl collar and then there's also increases down the side. And basically what they um, encouraged me to do was just skip all the increases. So split for the sleeves and skip the increases. So what I decided to do, and I'm just going to get my needle extender, my, my um, cable extender, 
And even though I'm in the middle of a row, I think that I can probably still pop this onto my dress form to show you guys. And I'll put it over top of my jingle for ease of showing you. Um, what I ended up doing was I, and you're also supposed to pick up a whole bunch of stitches under the arm or cast on a whole bunch of stitches under the arm for um, um, your sleeves. So I skipped all of that. So let me just um, transition to, uh, let's go to the main screen and we'll, and I'll pull up my dress form and I'll show you, I'll show you what, what I'm, what I'm talking about. So you guys can see Diane here, Diana. I think I just call her Diana. She's a Diana doll. Um, I saw on Slack there was a somebody, a couple people who got who had found, or one person who had found um, a uh, dress form secondhand. If you can find one secondhand, it's definitely the way to go. So this pattern is a contiguous top down, and um, it's a really fun knit. I have to admit, I'm really enjoying it. And I wish I wasn't in the middle of the row. That was just really poor planning on my part. But if you guys can kind of go with it with me, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of fiddle with this. So with a tank top and a flannel shirt and a sweater underneath, this thing is now, <laughs> it's still like, um, it's now like perfect. So what I was hoping was that the fronts here would match up um, and maybe even overlap a tiny bit. Um, and without a big bulky sweater underneath, that's exactly what will happen. But this is going to be perfect for camping. Um, this is a meat merino um, Suffolk blend. And it's really, really like a coarse yarn. Like it's not a nice next to the skin. This is a, this is a really great uh, warm, squishy, Aran weight, almost bulky. This is six millimeter needles. And... Um, it's just, and, it, and it, it comes right up at the back. Um, so it's going to keep the back of your neck really super warm. And um, I'll be able to wear it with, with a sweater underneath if I want to. And I'll still be able to kind of stretch the fronts across, like after it's washed and blocked. And the eye cord that you work along the front, it's worked under the arms here as well. And then down the back, it keeps the garter from just stretching out and going crazy so a really great way of kind of keeping the garter in 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 place um without sort of um you know having to really do anything so instead of casting on extra stitches under the arms i only cast on the four the three that i needed for the eye cord and i didn't do any more increasing through the shawl and i haven't done any increasing through the hips and as you can see my hips are um 30 are they 38 inches I think and I like to have my stuff at the bottom be about 40 inches to give me some some ease um this is going to be more than more than wide enough so uh because if I sort of pull like it's still got a lot of positive ease in it and it's got a nice feel to it so um I'm already down the body uh I think it was about eight inches when I when I last checked it was worth it to rip that out and to redo that uh, for sure. I think um, I think I would have been really bummed if I had just completely pulled it out and completely abandoned ship with it. But um, it's built from the top down. You do the shawl first um, at the back and then you um, uh, build out from there and then, and then uh, build out the sleeve caps and then you separate for everything. So you sort of end up with this sort of interesting shape and then you separate for the sleeves and it works really well so the camera's all confused now because the sun is so bright <laughs> so i hope you guys can sort of um bear with me here so i know the show is going to be a bit longer today but if you guys i know some of you are going to have to go but uh thank you for to those who are are, are sticking around um gotta go do dinner oh becca have a have a good evening <laughs> your bosom friend <laughs> Um, that's so funny. Sweater looks like it fits. Yeah, it's definitely way better, Jenny. The fit is just perfect. So, <laughs> Zan, Michael Jackson's Dirty Diana playing on loop in your head. Um, 
So that is that sweater. That's Marmore. So I think that that is everything that I want to share with you for my projects kind of up to this point. I've got some stuff happening in the background uh, that I um, am sort of just not quite ready to share. And it's stuff for, for um, um, our Patreon uh, teaching content. We're looking at uh, luxury fibers currently. So we this month we're looking at silks. Next month we're going to be looking at some mulberry silks. And we're also going to be looking at a silk sampler that I made, a big shawl and reflecting on how they knit up and what they sort of look like. Um, and then in March, we're going to be looking at spinning cashmere. So we're sort of doing kind of a luxury, an overarching luxury um, theme this year. We're sort of looking at, um, you know, what is luxury? Why do we covet these fibers and these yarns in our stash? It doesn't necessarily have to be a fiber that's like kiviet or yak or cashmere. It could be a braid that you didn't want to spin, that you hung on to for years and years and years. And uh, you know, why do we do that? So it's not always just time. If we wanted to do it, we would make the time. So that's some of the conversation that we're going to be having this year together um, in, Patre in the Patreon uh, um, content. Oh, that's awesome, uh, Deborah. I want to see, um, I want to see that her, I don't know how you say that, the Coburger Fox Wool. Um, that sounds amazing. So all right, community participation for January. Can you tell us about your most recent spin? Tell us what you've been doing at home. And in February, I will do a random draw. You can comment here on uh, YouTube or you can comment on Ravelry um, in the episode thread, which is here. I will link it in the live chat. So if you would like to tell us about your most recent spin and you can put that into the episode thread in the Ravelry group. Uh, on, on Ravelry, just make sure you're a member of the group or here on YouTube and I will be drawing randomly a number. I will do the tallying up between YouTube and Ravelry um, and I will will send this out. This is from Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks and this is a thin silk blend of Bullseye. So that's his fiber. I just started spinning this myself for my natural shades along, which I'm hoping I'll be able to share with you next week. And let me tell you, it is amazing. It is amazing fiber. Uh, Liz was incredibly generous for donating that to the show for me to be able to give away to you. And then um, I had asked her if I could purchase some for my natural shades along. And she's like, absolutely. And I'll send you a second one to give away on the show. And I was just gobsmacked. So you guys are lucky, 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 because I want to keep it all for me. <laughs> Um, all right, breeding color studies. So let's just do a quick transition and we'll have a look at what Kelly shared with us. This is her breeding color study. Um, this was our Char Rolet study. This, so this was our last breeding color study. So we were looking at Char Rolet and these were the colors that we were looking at based on the photo that Greta of uh, the warmest row, uh, she, that's her uh, Ravelry name. Uh, she's a very active member of the community and she's, she's um, a beautiful photographer. She um, was the Katrina's inspiration for this, this uh, study that we did from January through to the end of December. So Kelly shares, uh, the new breed and color study coming up motivated me to finish my second half of my Charolais bat. Spun short forward, one half spun red to green straight, and the other half she split to spin for a two-ply fractal. Her daughter has requested mittens. And I think Kelly's daughter is now, I think she's two and a half, almost three, I think. If that's if my memory serves because I think she was 18 months when I first met Kelly so she's probably getting a bit more outspoken about things that she maybe wants so well done Kelly beautiful spinning and uh, thank you for sharing now this is 51 yarns along Maria um, she's been working her way through double coated wools. So Maria shared her, this is group B for the 51 yarn spin along. So group B has just started their second year. Group A just finished. And if you're interested in hearing some reflections from the community about how their study went from start to finish, um, please have a listen to Wool and Spinning Radio, which is released for patrons every month. Uh, I was chatting this month with uh, Megan and Rebecca and they went all the way through group A from start to finish. 
and that will be released for everybody tomorrow uh, for uh, Wool and Spinning Radio. So um, if you're a patron of the show, even if just a dollar a month, you get Wool and Spinning Radio, which is the audio podcast that goes along with uh, the show. So Maria shares her samples of white, uh, I think it's Aland sheep wool, it was, is a two-coated wool. This breed is often uh, two-coated, but they are not all the same. She washed the locks in lingerie bags and she has wool combs and she separated the outer and inner coats just by pulling the longer ones out first and combing them separately later. Here is the inner coat in Ness and the outer laying on the table. Just beautiful yarn. Gorgeous. So I think this one is, if my memory serves, this one is the outer coat. The previous one was the inner coat. So really lovely spinning, Maria. Thank you so much for sharing. And you can see the difference between the long and the short. Uh, so the longer um, outer coat, you can see how that yarn just naturally, it goes to a, very, a much gentler twist angle. It's not quite as tightly twisted. This is the inner coat a little bit more tightly twisted, a little bit more severe, a little bit um, higher twist angle compared to um, this one, which is really interesting. You can see how just naturally the yarns just look different and it's because they're different, different, different fibers need to be spun a different way. Oh, that's cool. So Austria Kober Fox is a breed, the breed of the year in Germany of 2020. There are Deborah's own sheep. Very cool, Deborah. I can't wait to see her sweater now. <laughs> that pattern would be great for her sweat, for her, her wool. I think, I think you should um, share photos, please. I want to see the sheep. <laughs> If you don't mind, uh, Deborah, they usually call its fleece the golden fleece as its natural color is creamy white with a golden hue. Oh, that is so cool, Deborah. Learn something new every day. Yeah, please. I would love to see Kathy. Kathy's asking too. Uh, can you share a picture on Slack sometime? Yeah, I would love to see that too, Deborah, please. So we have our natural shades along going on in the uh, uh, community. And this is from Fairy Ring Farm. She, uh, our natural shades along, it's just an opportunity to explore all the natural shades of all the natural fibers out there. So whether it's cotton or uh, ramy or flax or silk or wool or anything, we're just looking at natural shades and this is going to go on indefinitely and everybody can participate. Um, it, you're welcome. Um, a lot of people have a lot of different breeds in their, in their stashes that are maybe semi-spun. They're just sitting in yarn form. Maybe it's still in fiber form. Uh, so it's just an opportunity to celebrate, um, natural shades. So Fairy Ring Farm, she has made this she made her natural shades along a shawl a couple of years ago, but found it too cumbersome to wear. So she decided to turn it into a throw blanket instead. It is a bit of a memory blanket since it's made mostly of, from fibers of her own animals with samples of experimental spinning. It's spun on drop spindles, supported Tuni Tackley, um, Bane's spinning wheel, and her new to her Lendrum DT. There's black, brown, and white alpaca from a neighbor, black, brown, and white from her departed Shetlands, her dog uh, caper, several shades of satin angora, white French angora, natural green, and fawn cotton. It's a variety of spinning styles and yarn types, and she's a fairly new knitter, so it's fun experimenting with the different stitches. Beautiful, beautiful. Love this so much. And you can see like where the Angora is, you can see where, where the dog hair is, like you can see where those different textures come through. I, I just think it's amazing. What a wonderful um, tribute to those animals and to uh, the, uh, their love and your love for them. It's really, really amazing. Really neat. So another natural shades along was a sweater that Rebecca finished. This is Rebby J. She lives up in Rankin Inlet in Nunavut in Northern Canada. Uh, she's finished her uh, natural shades along sweater. So she's been slowly slogging through the body and sleeves and has been marooned on Sleeve Island for like a month. But I was bound and determined to finish this thing before the end of 2020. She cast off yesterday, which I think was like December 30th or something. Um, she, she blocked it overnight and then put it on for pictures and haven't taken it off since. No outdoor pictures here, folks. It's minus 20 something. Wind is 50 kilometers per hour gusting. 70. Uh, we're on day three of a blizzard. She could go on. <laughs> um, thinking of you, Rebecca. I'm sure some folks would find Icelandic scratchy, but this just feels cozy to me. I'm glad the neckline is wide though, and my undershirt collar is high. It doesn't bother my hands though, and she may have cast on another natural, sh natural colored hand spun sweater today. Not because she's, I'm hopeless, 
just because it's what I have in stash. That's awesome. I'm excited to see it, Rebecca. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And I'm not sure if those are considered anukshuks on her on the yoke or if they are called something else when they have legs. I can't remember, which I feel terrible about. I should know that. So hopefully Rebecca can clarify exactly what they're called that are on the yoke of the sweater. And I'm not sure if she designed the yoke herself. I Those are a couple of questions I need to ask her. Another one from Maria, her natural shades beanie went as in a Christmas gift to her niece. The Tweety Charolais yarn did not work with this pattern. I wonder if it was, I wonder what about the Tweety yarn didn't work, Maria. I would love to hear if it just, you didn't like, it wasn't enough contrast or if um, it wasn't great for color work. Um, it would be, it would, I would love to hear um, the, the reasons for that, Maria. So finally, Zero to Hero for 2020, we have started, we have finished uh, Zero to Hero for 2020. So for those who don't know what Zero to Hero is, basically it's an opportunity to go from fiber uh, to whether or not it's already processed or you're going to process it yourself or do the fiber prep yourself or you've already uh, bought fiber that's processed. So it might be a braid, might be some pin drafted roving, it might be some comb top that you're going to dye. It doesn't matter. Fiber to yarn to finished item. It could be woven, it could be knit, it could be crocheted, whatever. The opportunity here is to go from, um, it, and to choose something relatively substantial. Like this isn't like one braid. We're talking about like a relatively substantial thing that you really want to work your way through that's gonna take many months. And we're here to support you to get through it. So you can share your progress as you go, ask questions as you go. Uh, for many of us, uh, when we first started doing Zero to Hero back in 2016, it was an opportunity to um, just help each other through the process because, you know, sampling often takes time, not really sure what to do with your samples when you're done, you know, which of these samples is good, which one should I do, um, you know, what am I, you know, yarn structure, my finished item, I'm not sure what I want to make, or maybe I do and I have to work backwards. There's lots and lots of things to work through when you're going through that first big, big, big spin. So that's what Zero to Hero is for. So we have started the thread for 2021. If you haven't finished your Zero to Hero for 2020 and you want to continue working on it through 2021, absolutely. Just because the calendar flipped over does not mean our projects just suddenly magically get finished. So please just carry on. I just wanted to start a new thread to clean up the old one because the old one was at like page 40 or 50 or something. It was crazy. It was really, really long. The other place that you can share this stuff if you are not on Ravelry is on the Slack channel under hashtag sweater spin, hashtag uh, fiber prep. Uh, some of the other places people have been sharing is hashtag weaving if they're doing a weaving project. So there's lots of places to talk about your project if you're having trouble and you're not on Ravelry. So this is from Kelly. This was her zero to hero. She technically finished it on January 1st. This is um, Kelly. I don't know if she's still in the chat. She was here earlier. Oh yeah, there she is. Um, beautiful sweater, by the way. Um, I actually chatted with her earlier this week and she was wearing it and it looks amazing. And she talks about it a little bit more in the Wool and Spinning Radio episode that we recorded for later in February. And it was fun to kind of see her in it and to see it on. So you can find Kelly at Dominion Fleece or at uh, Tomatil on uh, Ravelry. Uh, she wove in the ends today on January 1st. My 2020 Zero to Hero is all done. She used a Tunis fleece from a farm about two and a half hours southwest of me. So she's in northern Alberta in Edmonton. She scoured the fleece Orvis paste for those interested. She picked with her wool picker, then carded each bat through about three times. She spun short continuous backward and did a sample soak and snap to finish and did a simple soak and snap to finish. Those who have followed uh, along for a bit know that I had planned a Derwent by Sarah Cook. The yarn was too darn thick and so I created a semi knockoff. Fits wonderfully and despite bumps along the way this year for my raw to finish garment project it all worked out in the end. For those extra interested in fine details, the finished yarn was about 9 to 10 wraps per inch. The grist was 740 yards per pound. If anybody could do that quick translation to kilos, meters per kilo, that would be awesome. 740 yards per pound to meters to kilos for those who are metric. And she used about 900 yards total. So she used just over a pound of fiber. 
The wraps per inch of my singles was about 14 and she cannot for the life of her find her sample card. But if memory serves, she did about 2.5 twists per inch in the singles and the ply. Since it's pretty standard for me for a medium wool, she did she and she didn't do anything special in that respect. So yeah, gorgeous, stunning. I, I totally agree, you guys. So thank you so much for sharing all of your projects and for loading photos and for doing all the things, you guys. That's what makes this community so so wonderful to be a part of and it's so inspiring. So thank you for continuing to uh, share and to be a part of the community. I really appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, we will say goodbye because this show has been very long today and I really appreciate all of your time here. Um, thank you so, so much for being here and for spending the time. Uh, next week, we're we're sort of back to regular scheduled programming. So live live streams will be on uh, Saturday mornings going forward, as always. Thank you, Barbel. 1,400 meters per kilo. Um, so 740 yards per pound is roughly about 1,411 meters per kilo. Thank you, you guys. Um, I, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Stay safe and stay uh, calm and stay kind wherever you are. Thank you for lifting one another up and for uh, continuing to be such amazing people. I'm so, so grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you so much. I will see you guys next Saturday. And if in the meantime, you've got any questions or you want to know anything, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. There is, um, I used to put all of the housekeeping and all the links and all the stuff in the show notes, but I, I'm going to trial taking it out and doing it as a monthly post called housekeeping on the blog and on Patreon, just to kind of keep it separate and keep it a bit cleaner. So if you're looking for posts, that's going to go for links to stuff like the book, um, the current content that's available on Patreon, um, what we're working on, the Wool and Spinning Radio episodes, all of that is going to go up in one post once a week. And um, I hope you, I hope it just kind of cleans up the show notes a little bit. It makes it a bit easier for me as I'm working through the live streams. It's a little bit less stuff for me to have to visually intake while I am with you guys. So I hope that that works. In the meantime, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy dreaming, happy all the things. I will see you guys next week. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.